Good morning. I'm just going to keep repeating it until she turns me up, don't worry. Good morning. That sounds better, right? Fabulous. Welcome to Holy Trinity on this fourth Sunday after Pentecost. We're so happy to have you all here. Before we get started, a few announcements. The first is, as of Tuesday until next Monday, myself and Matthew will be away. We are uh, diocesan delegates for General Synod, so we are going to be in the wonderful, warm, beautiful place of Calgary for seven days doing all kinds of work for the Anglican Church of Canada. It's really exciting to go. As many of you know, I am very big on ecumenical work and full communion agreements, and we are presenting. I've been part of the Lutheran Anglican Moravian working group for the last two years, putting together one flock, one shepherd, which is a full communion agreement between the Moravians, the Lutherans, and the Anglicans. And we are presenting it at our synod in hopes that it will pass. The Moravians just had their synod, and they passed it unanimously. So I'm very excited for this synod. There's lots of other important work, but please, please, please keep this trilateral full communion agreement in your prayers that it passes, because I think it will mean great, amazing things for the church, Canada-wide, worldwide. With that said, I'm not gonna be as quick at responding to emails, but I will get back to you. So if you send me an email and don't hear back from me right away, you will, just give me a little bonus time. With that said, a huge thank you ahead of time to Reverend Robin Walker and Reverend Rob for taking the service next week. So it'll be service as normal, no interruption. So a huge thank you for being able to do that. After church today, everyone is invited downstairs for hospitality hour. Our hospitality hour this week is very much not just geared to pride, but super geared to our kids. The Kids Church is going to be presenting their project they've been working on for the whole year, which is a replica of Jerusalem, and they would love it if you would come downstairs, look at what they've been working on, and there's cake, and there's cookies, and there's ice cream, there's lots of good stuff. Please do, after the service, go downstairs, see what the kids have been working on. And then a little after their presentation, we will be having a roundtable discussion from Annie, who is our Newcomers, Young Adults, and Social Justice Coordinator, on what it means to be a welcoming and affirming church. So that'll be a roundtable discussion after the presentation downstairs. I do hope you come on down. With that said, I invite you to take a few moments as we prepare our hearts and minds to enter into morning worship. I invite the congregation to please stand as able as we sing our opening hymn number 585, Lord Whose Love in Humble Service.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray the collect of the day. God, our protector, you stood by David in the time of trial. Stand by us through all life storms, giving us courage to risk danger, to protect those who are opposed and poor, so that they may know you as their stronghold and hope. Amen. I invite the congregation to please be seated, and I invite any kids present to come on forward. Good morning. How's everyone doing today? What's today? Do you guys have a big presentation for us today? Yeah. Are you super excited about it? Yeah. You're super excited? Awesome. So this is the last day of kids' church before summer, right? So I have a question. What's been your favorite part this year? For you, probably working on the big project? Yes. Same. Anyone have anything different? Yeah. The play. The play was pretty oh, that stellar. Was that was pretty awesome, too, wasn't it? What else? What other cool things have you done this year? Advent candles and decorating trees, absolutely. <coughs> so, have you had lots of fun? Yes. Are your teachers pretty spectacular? Do you think maybe we should do a big thank you to Heather and Andrew and Sharon and Nicholas and Anne for helping? Think we should give them a big thank you? What do you think, big kids of the congregation? Should we give a big round of applause? <laughs> They're pretty amazing, aren't they? Are they pretty amazing? Well, I'm not going to hold you up. I just wanted to know what everyone's favorite part of it was this year because I'm a little jealous that while you guys are having fun, we have to sit up here and be good and <laughs> listen. It's rough. We do hope to stand up for long times. It's exhausting. But I'm glad you guys have had fun. And I'm so glad we can say big thank yous to your teacher. And I think all of us are super excited to see this project you've been working on. So before we go downstairs to finish the final touches, what should we do? Pray, that's right. This is a repeat after me prayer. <laughs> Dear God, thank you for friends, thank you for fun, and thank you for teachers who remind us how much you love us. Please help us have a safe and a fun summer. Amen. Wonderful. I invite the big kids for the last time before summer break to stand up and sing our kiddos off to kids' church.
invite the congregation to be seated as we listen to what the Spirit is saying to the church. A reading from Genesis. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bowshot. For she said, Do not let me look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid. For God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. The word of the Lord.
reading from the letter to the Romans. What then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may increase? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death, so that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that a body of sin might be destroyed, so that we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is free from sin. But if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he gives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said to the twelve apostles, A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher, and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them. For nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell it in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Creator in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Creator in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. This is the Gospel of Christ. Let us pray. 
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Today, we heard the conclusion to last week's Mission Impossible. As Jesus prepares his 12 closest followers for their first solo mission. This mission isn't a light and an easy one. This mission is life-changing. These 12 newly minted apostles are sent to show what God's kingdom looks like, interrupting life as they know it with new possibilities for healing, for wholeness, for truth-telling and repaired relationships. In last week's gospel, Jesus empowered them to do the things, the important things. Jesus entrusted them with spiritual authority to go forth and proclaim the kingdom of God. They were told, as you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick. Raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Today, Jesus adds something to that to-do list, and it's something major. Jesus, on the cusp of sending his 12 inexperienced disciples out into the world, pauses to arm them with a final spiritual gift, the ability to persevere in the face of resistance. Jesus doesn't sugarcoat the dangers of this mission. He gives it to them straight. Some folks will welcome the good news, others won't. They'll resist the message and the change that comes with it, and you'll be the target of their resistance. Then Jesus reminds them that our heavenly creator is both incredibly powerful, pronouncing judgments that yield life or death, and incredibly tender, noticing every sparrow that falls and counting every hair on our heads. Jesus reminds the twelve of who they truly are, children of God. Jesus teaches them what they're capable of, healing others and reconciling communities. And Jesus shows them how to hold onto that truth even when the going gets tough, by remembering God's character, God's faithfulness, and God's goodness. It took years of hanging out with Jesus, eating with him, watching him heal others, speaking truth to power, listening to his teaches, and overhearing his prayers, for them to become the kind of people who were willing to testify to God's peace in a world still enraptured by powers and principalities. They knew, like we know, that Christian identity and character formation are lifelong processes. So now, to talk about the part of the reading that none of us particularly like. In fact, it's a part we often ignore, we skim past, and we pretend that we never heard. One of the most troubling parts of this passage to our ears is Jesus talking to us about divisions in the family. As a society, we tend to covet the nuclear family and we idolize it. As such, many of us, we downplay family conflict. We're embarrassed by it, admitting that our families are imperfect can feel like we failed. At the same time, having an imperfect family seems to be the cultural norm, a shared experience rather than an exception. Because family, you see, is a hard and a very complex thing, and Jesus knew that. And psychologists today back this assertion up. Psychology tells us that a key developmental task for young adults is differentiating from one's family of origin. This doesn't mean estrangement, but rather it means figuring out how one can authentically be oneself and stay connected to family and to others. For example, if a young adult chooses to live a life of radical simplicity in a family that values climbing the social ladder, 
the family will have to navigate new ways of being together. Or if a young adult chooses to express themselves with piercings, different colored hair, and tattoos in a family that values the traditional view of what it looks like to be a professional, the family is going to have to navigate new ways of being together. And even more pressing, especially since it's Pride Month, when a young adult or a young teenager or a senior, age really doesn't matter, feels safe enough to come out to their family, and that family is unaware or uneducated on our LGBTQ2SIA plus communities, that family is going to have to learn to navigate some new ways of being together. And the reality is, the reality that Jesus knew of is that not every family has those navigational skills. Sometimes, literally and figuratively, it's beneficial or even necessary to be apart from one's family of origin. Sometimes, brother will hate brother. Sister will hate sister. Family relationships will be strained, and hearts are going to ache. But belief in God, faith in Jesus, and trust in the Holy Spirit can bring peace beyond our human understanding. The truth is, the peace that Jesus brings can cause division. It can incite harassment and create resistance. The love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit can lead to the death of some relationships. But just as Jesus equipped the first disciples long ago, he equips us with the power of the Holy Spirit to confront the ways of turbulent relationships and shows us how we can, through love, triumph over them. Jesus teaches us about love, about forgiveness, and about just how big and beautiful our family truly is. By hearing the scripture week by week, day by day, the Spirit equips us with knowledge of God's character, both the Almighty Maker of heaven and earth and the merciful Lord who watches over the sparrows and counts each of the hairs on our heads. And when we just can't fathom or imagine how the almighty power and the gentleness of God can possibly work side by side, we remember stories like the one we heard from the book of Acts about Hagar and her son Ishmael. Hagar's story shows God's grace working in and through a very divided family. Sarah, Abraham's wife, and the woman to whom Hagar was enslaved into service to is bound up by anxiety and by fear. Hagar dutifully conceived a son at Sarah's request with her husband Abraham and bore Ishmael. But now Sarah is afraid that Ishmael may be favored more than her boy, Isaac. Though Sarah has literally borne of the fruit of God's promises through the birth of Isaac, her jealousy has gotten the best of her, and she can't stomach even the presence of Hagar. Abraham is caught, not only between these two women, but by his genuine affection for his firstborn, Ishmael. But Sarah's jealousy wins out. Hagar and Ishmael are cast out of the family and left to die in the wilderness. And at first glance, this seems like a win-lose situation, with Sarah securing a future for her son Isaac, while Hagar and Ishmael perish. This story shows that God's grace is bigger than we can imagine. This story shows the almighty power and the true gentleness of our God. Like the disciples in our gospel, we are sometimes sent out on risky missions, warned and, equ and equipped to face the danger. Other times, like Hagar and Ishmael, we are cast out into the wilderness without any choice. But even there, we discover God's grace goes before us. We learn to respond to division, to harassment, even estrangement, with greater patience and confidence. Trusting that God's mission of reconciliation and love, taught to us by navigating new ways and changing our old ways,
by witnessing to the great stories of people like Sarah and Hagar, Isaac and Ishmael, and by families divided by politics, money, jealousy, or addiction. We learn, we see that the love of God will persevere, that love will triumph over evil, and that sometimes when we least expect it, the love of God will peek out in the most unexpected of places and guide us home. What home looks like for each of us is different. Where home is for each of us is different. Sometimes, home is with those that we share blood with. Oftentimes, it's not. But always, always our homes should be somewhere where we feel the love of God, where we see God's grace, and are told, and where we know indefinitely that we are each God's beloved children, where we are all welcome and called to a family much bigger than we can even ask and even imagine. My friends, welcome home. invite the congregation to please stand as able as we confess the faith of our baptism in the words of the Apostles' Creed as we say, I believe in God. invite the congregation to assume whatever posture you find most prayerful for the prayers of the people. Friends, on this St. John's weekend, where the summer is arriving and the smoke has dissipated for a time, let us now pray for the church and the world around us, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us now pray for our bishops, our priests, and our deacons, and for all their helpers in the church. In our own diocese of Edmonton, we pray for our bishop Stephen, and for Larry, the Lutheran bishop of Alberta and territories. In our national church, we pray for Linda, our primate, Gregory, our Metropolitan, for the Indigenous Bishop for Treaty 7, Sydney, and for the General Synod as they prepare to meet this coming week. That our churches may be filled with and proclaim the truth of Christ's holy and life-giving resurrection to all. Lord, in your mercy. Let us now pray for all of God's people throughout the world, for this congregation, and for all the ministers and people who witness to your love. We pray for our brothers and sisters in God overseas, including for our sister diocese of Bouye in Burundi, and their parish of Kabata. And as Pride Week comes to a close, or sorry, Pride Month comes to a close, and as many Commonwealth countries remember the legacy of the Windrush generation, let us pray for all those who are either in the LGBTQ plus community, or in the black community, or in both. Too often, Lord, black people suffer racism and prejudice, and the LGBTQ community faces homophobia and transphobia. 
even from each other. Let us pray, then, that all peoples may truly see the many colors that make up the rainbow of God's love, and not just the colors that they want to see. That all communities throughout the world may find fresh strength in Christ's good news. Lord, in your mercy. Let us now pray for Charles, our King, and all the members of the Canadian royal family. Let us always give thanks to God for the many freedoms that we have here. So we pray for our new legislature, as the members have now taken their oaths and they begin their work. We pray that our new government may govern with wisdom and with mercy always mindful of God's many warnings in scripture to those who fail to do so. And let us also pray and give thanks for the First Nations, remembering always whose land we have all entered and the treaties which govern that entry. And so today, we pray for the Ermine Skin Cree Nation and for the various urban indigenous communities among us that our several nations may live and grow in unity, peace, and reconciliation. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Let us now pray for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, those in trouble, those in prison, those who suffer for whatever reason, either aloud or in the quiet of our hearts. Praying especially for those who are on our parish's prayer list. For Roger, for Ed, for Gertrude and Natalie, for Margaret Ann and her family, for Mildred, for Bill and his family, for Anne, Mickey, for Ron and Joan, for Ron, and for Joseph. We also pray for all those who have had to flee wildfires and flooding this past month. For all those who have lost their homes due to fire and flood. And for all the firefighters and the first responders as they battle these ongoing forest fires. That all of us may see deliverance and hope, be it in prosperity, be it in times of trial. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Mighty God, our merciful Father, we ask that you hear these our prayers to make before you, both our joy and our troubles. Graciously hear us so that all evils which have, put, have been put upon us by the craft of both the devil and man may come to nothing and may be dispersed by your goodness and that we may evermore bear a faithful witness to you. And we pray this for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate, to whom with you and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy, welcoming sinners and inviting us to this table. Let us confess our sins, confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the 
glory of your name. Amen. May Almighty God have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all of our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. My friends, I invite you to please be to please stand as able. The peace of the Lord be always with you. I invite you to share a sign of peace with those around you. invite the congregation to join in our offertory hymn, which, will you, which you will find on the back of your purple insert called All the Colors of the Rainbow.
eternal God, you have made our Savior, Jesus Christ, the head of all creation. Receive all we offer you this day, and renew us in his risen life in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We give you thanks and praise, Almighty God, through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. He is your living Word, through whom you have created all things. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh of the Virgin Mary and shared our human nature. He lived and died as one of us to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. In fulfillment of your will, he stretched out his hands in suffering to bring release to those who place their hope in you. And so he won for you a holy people. He chose to bear our griefs and sorrows and to give up his life on the cross, that he might shatter the chains of evil and death and banish the darkness of sin and despair. By his resurrection, he brings us into the light of your presence. Now with all creation, we raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious God, accept our praise through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on the night he was handed over to suffering and death, took bread and gave you thanks, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This is my blood, which is shed for you. When you do this, you do it in memory of me. Remembering, therefore, his death and resurrection, we offer you this bread and this cup, giving thanks that you have made us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon the offering of your holy church. Gather into one all who share in these sacred mysteries, filling them with the Holy Spirit and confirming their faith in the truth, that together we may praise you and give you glory through your servant Jesus Christ. All honor and glory are yours, Father and Son, with the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Church, now and forever. Savior Christ has taught us, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We 
These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. The table is set, all are welcome, our bread is gluten-free for all to share in the one bread, one body. So we'll have two stations set up today, one on the floor, one at the rail. Please go to whichever station you are most comfortable with.
invite the congregation to please stand as able. Let us pray. Almighty God, guide and protect your people who share in this sacred mystery, and keep us always in your love, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the Church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of the Son, Jesus Christ our Savior, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Creator, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among us and remain with us always. Amen. And just a reminder for anyone who came in after the announcements, our kids have a very special presentation for us downstairs at Hospitality. So please do, if you're able to stay for a bit, come on downstairs and let the kids show you what they've been working on. With that said, our recessional hymn is number 505, Be Thou My Vision. to the world to love and serve the Lord. Thanks. Thanks.